Okay. Okay. Hi everyone. I see that uh, some people are joining us here in Zoom, and some people I hope are watching us on Facebook translation. Uh, my name is Anastasia Bobrova. I am analyst and project manager in uh, Think Tank, and I am happy to welcome you to one of one of our public events. And today, together with David Smith, uh, founder and CEO of Affordable Housing Institute, we are going to talk about housing in the US, myths and realities. We're going to talk about housing ecosystem in the US, what are the lessons we can draw from housing policy in the US in Ukraine. And yeah, uh, today, yeah, I see people are joining now here as more. And um, David will be presenting to us. And then if you have any questions, you can write it down to chat. You can later, after the presentation, you can discuss it. You can raise your hand and you can discuss it. You can also post your questions uh, under the Facebook translation. Um, and then we will transfer those questions to David. You can ask your questions either in Ukrainian or in English, and we will be able to understand. Okay. I think that without further ado, I will give the floor to David Smith. David, you're on. Enable screen share, please. Yeah, because you um, yes. connected and that just a second. I think nope. now, now you're able, yeah. There we go. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I am honored to be here. I do want to say that um, I'm particularly honored that Setos has asked me because I think you folks do great work and should continue doing great work uh, as will become apparent in the course of this talk. I believe that housing is essential to the recovery and rebound of Ukraine uh, once the war is over and it is seen that Ukraine has won it, uh, that's sometime in the future. But for now, <clears throat> it's important to both do, take all the steps possible to rehouse as many Ukrainians as can be done, whether they're internally displaced or refugees, and to encourage Ukrainians everywhere to go to work on rebuilding your cities. Um, I should mention that in giving this talk, in all the years I've been doing this, no one's ever asked me before to talk about the myths and the realities of the US system. I've talked about it often enough, but I've never been asked to do it formally. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, I put up here a picture of how much America's approach to affordable housing has changed. The picture on the left is from about 1955 when America was a country of suburbs and where mom, dad, and 2.4 children plus a pet would move into their new single family home in a subdivision. And the reality in America in 2022 is that if you're, everybody thinks we do not have enough affordable housing, but if you try to put affordable housing in anybody's neighborhood, the neighbors don't want it. So that's part of the paradox of change about America. Why listen to me? Well, I'm funny. I'm old. Uh, I try to provide evocative content. I've worked all over the world, lots of different places. At the drop of a hat, I will tell stories and I will make a fool of myself in order to be memorable because that's the way adults learn. You will only learn if you're being entertained and I will slip the learning in with the entertainment. So in this talk, I am going to do the myths and realities of the US system. But before I do that, even that, I want to give you some fundamental building blocks of urban policy everywhere in the world. I should mention there's a lot of English text on my slides. Um, most of the text is information combined with jokes. Uh, don't try to read the text now, save them for later. You'll get the slides afterwards. They'll be posted on Sedos' site. They are in David speak, which is a language that isn't even quite English. So good luck in understanding the jokes. But I will do the building blocks. They're very important. Then I'm going to talk about America's affordable housing ecosystem. 
how people think it works and how it really works. And for each of the points that I'm going to bring up, I will try to identify what that means for Ukraine. Because America is a fine place, but what America does is not important to Ukraine unless there is something you can do in your situation now. So I'll talk about that. There'll be a little more time for open questions and answers. If you ask me questions that I don't know the answer to, I will make one up on the spot. That's part of the secret of my success. All right. So the picture that you see here is an, is an illustration of, in effect, how I have learned this business. I have been, I have been drinking affordable housing for 46 years. That is a still, in case those of you who don't know, that's how you make illegal liquor in the Appalachian Mountains and so on. It's a fine old American tradition. And I put that up there because what I'm going to try to give you is the distilled essence of what 40 year, 46 years of drinking affordable housing has led me to. Here's the first one. Affordable housing is infrastructure. It is in many ways the most important infrastructure of your city because affordable housing is where jobs go to sleep at night. Okay, housing is where all jobs go to sleep at night. The picture on the right is an illustration of the fact that every time you add a job to your city, that means you've added a workplace, you have to add a home and you have to add a commute going back and forth between those two things, okay? So when you see a traffic jam, it's the first thing I want you to do, whether it's in Ukraine or anywhere else you are, if you see a traffic jam during daylight hours, I want you to think to yourself somewhere there's a job and there's a house and the job and the house are distant from one another. And successful cities bring the jobs and the housing closer together. Second rule, we found this out in Orange County, USA. For every high income job you create, you will create about five middle and low income jobs. So the city does not exist that has no poor people in it. Doesn't matter how rich your city is, doesn't matter how many oligarchs you've got, most of the housing has to be aimed at middle and lower income people, and it has to be in proximity to jobs. Because housing, plus what people pay to get to and from work, eats up about 60% of the average household budget. If one of those costs goes up, the other cost has to go down. So if, you're, if your housing costs a lot, you can't pay very much for transportation. If your transportation costs a lot, you can't pay very much for housing, which is why cities have a habit of pushing affordable housing out to the peripheries, out to the edges. And the other thing that happens is if you get in a squeeze, because housing gets expensive or commuting gets expensive, the rent eats first. If families have disposable income, they will spend it on their on food, they will spend it on their kids' education and their kids' opportunity, and they will spend it on health. If they don't have that 40% residual income, that's what they have to cut. They have to cut food or cut children's education or cut health. So big debate in America these days, and it's framed in racial terms, is that if you have parts of a city where housing is both expensive and of poor quality and where they are far from jobs, you are actually spatially condemning some people to poverty because they lack the residual income to give their kids good nutrition, to give their kids a good education and to keep themselves healthy. Okay, first idea. Second idea, housing supply, housing markets are very dynamic markets, but they can be unusually constrained in one of three ways. The first one is by the cost or the labor to build. The first housing that almost anybody creates in a pioneer environment is self-built housing with scavenged materials. 
That picture, by the way, that photograph is from Oregon in the year 1890. So just 130 years ago, people were building homes in Oregon in the logging areas with self-built materials and home labor. This is the most common construct of most of the housing in the world. Second, you are constrained by the cost to build. And the cost to build as we move out of the wilderness and into an urban environment is land, infrastructure, and the right to develop. The picture that you see there now is what we would call a mobile home community or in slang, a trailer park. Those units are single wides. They're about 10 feet wide and about 30 to 40 feet long. They come on the back of a trailer truck and you plunk them down on a site. Once upon a time, America had thousands of these trailer parks and they were the first form of settlement in the post-World War II era in America. They don't have a lot of infrastructure. That's a dirt road, that's cheap wiring. There's probably not a lot of water and sanitation. They're probably heated with propane tanks, but it's cheap to build and it's easy to build. And I want to flag for your thinking in Ukraine, what you're looking at there is a 1955 model of manufactured housing. The models of manufactured housing that are available now are much better, much cheaper, much more insulated. So it is possible that in some situations you might want to put up manufactured housing communities in relocation places for IDPs. Third, you need permission to build. And increasingly as the urban environment gets, gets built up and gets complicated, the cost of getting the legal right to build eats up all the other two costs. So what happens is, as your city becomes larger and more complex, Urban affordable housing becomes the expression of the government's commitment to people or lack of commitment to people. In real, you know, Tip O'Neill, a fellow from Cambridge, Massachusetts, who became Speaker of the House of Representatives, said all politics is real estate, is local politics. I'll go farther. All real estate is local politics. So that's the second big idea. Third big idea. When you are dealing with cities. Affordable housing always costs money. I won't go through all the land use economics, but suffice it to say, when there are more jobs with more people and more spending, that drives up effective demand. Effective demand is what people can and will pay for housing. The economy going up means affordability goes down. Loss of affordability is an adverse side effect of urbanization and a successful economy. And I haven't got time to prove it, but I'm old and have a beard. So believe me when I tell you that by itself, the market will never produce enough affordable housing. It's always adversely selected in the real estate environment. It's always adversely selected relative to home ownership or condominiums or high-end stuff. This is true all around the world. So if you want affordable housing, you have to have government become involved. And government can do that. And I'm gonna do this at warp speed. I just want you to watch this and trust me, there's lots of additional information. This is the kind of thing, Anastasia, that would make a great course for several hours consideration. It goes like this, a family has money, has kids, is ready to move in. It wants a dwelling, okay? The dwelling can be created by somebody who we will call for this purpose a developer, but the family needs a dwelling that can be moved into legally that they can afford and that is at a price that made it worth somebody's while to develop it, okay? So what that means is that the family has to be eligible they have to apply for the housing. They need subsidy. I'm gonna come back to subsidy when we talk about myths and realities. There are already some subsidies in Ukraine. There will be some more. They have to pass a credit check. If they're buying the house, they have to get a loan and they have to close the loan. They have to have the loan funded, which will skip how the funding works. 
the loan has to be serviced. You have to make the payments every month. And if you don't service it, something else happens, which we'll come back to. So that's the journey that the customer goes through. The home starts with land. Of all the assets in the world, housing is distinctive because it's the only one you build at the place you use it, with the exception of manufactured housing. And uh, by the way, um, Krishna, thanks for popping the comments in chat. Everybody is encouraged to pop comments into chat. I can walk and chew gum at the same time, but I can't respond to them while also talking. I've only got the one mouth. Um, people would think I have two mouths, the, the amount I talk, but I actually have only the one. Anyway, we start with land. The land needs trunk infrastructure. A lot of trunk infrastructure in Ukraine, in the cities of Ukraine has been destroyed. That trunk infrastructure is going to have to be rebuilt. We'll come back to that, but I just wanna flag your attention to the fact that to get back to where you want to be, you have to rebuild trunk infrastructure in damaged cities. Next, you have to lay the property out on the site. I'm gonna do that very quickly and skip it. Then it has to be designed which includes what kind of units, how big, how tall. Then most important step, somebody has to start putting a lot of money out and take the risk that when it's done, the homes will be sold. There's a lot of risks. You have to hire a general contractor. You have to complete it. You have to bring the people to the home with their money and close, presto, change out. If they don't pay, you need a form of enforcement, which we won't talk about. And, he, and if they are paying, you have to manage it, which is particularly an issue if you're dealing with high rise or townhouses or urban housing. There's a ton of material we've written about this. Government enables, there are many handoffs, government enables or disables every step of the way. We've got an explanatory methodology on this value chain. We've used it all over the world. It's like gravity. It's different in different places, but it works everywhere if you adapt it to context. Those of you who are student types, we've spent 15 years in developing it and using it and proving it and it works. So there you are. So I'm gonna stop there for just a second. I'll take two or three minutes worth of questions. The questions, if you can speak English, you can, you can call your question out. If you can't speak English or don't want to, you can write it in the chat and Anastasia or her colleague will ask. So I'll pause there for just a sec. Hearing none. No, but I'm also monitoring Facebook translation. If you have any questions and if you want to write in the Facebook translation, please feel free to do so. Mm. All right. Uh, hello, David. This is Krishna. Hi, Krishna. Uh, yeah, uh, I belong to the American Planning Association. Uh, we have a task force on Ukraine, post-war reconstruction. Uh, we'll be more than happy to join you and uh, help Ukraine. Excellent. Um, well, uh, I put my email address up in the slides. Um, I respond to emails. And I know uh, as proof that I respond to emails that Julie Lawson is on the call because Julie and I have been having an email exchange and we've not yet had a face-to-face -face or ear-to-ear -ear or actual conversational exchange. So Julie, thank you, welcome. Um, with that, let's get back to our show. Okay. So now, myths and realities. The first myth of American affordable housing is that America is all about home ownership. The picture that you see there comes from a brochure that was put out in 1922 by the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. And for those of you who can't quite read the tiny text, it says, homeowning breeds real men. It is what puts the man back in manhood. So we said 100 years ago, we say things a little more different, a little differently now. Now, how, now home ownership is the American dream, but the reality, the reality is that home ownership makes up only about 65% of all the tenures in the United States. 30% of all the households in the United States live in conventional market rental housing. Home ownership, by the way, includes condominiums and cooperatives and that kind of urban form. 30% is in the conventional marketplace. 5% of all households or tenures, maybe even a little less than 
are in what you would call social rental, what I call affordable rental, which includes government owned, nonprofit owned, or for profit owned, subject to government regulation. But all of that 5% is consciously created affordable housing under government programs. It's worth noting that that 65% number is similar to UK, France, Netherlands. Germany has a lower level because both Germany and the Dutch have a system that, that regulates even conventional ownership and rental differently. It's also important not to lose sight of that the demographics of Netherlands and Germany are relatively flat population whereas the demographics of America are that the population is rising. And our population is rising both because of natural you know, uh, birth rates, but also because of immigration. And, and in the specific case of Ukraine, your population before February had been declining relative to where it was 10 or 15 years before that. And that has influenced where you have your tenure models. If your population starts to rise, and particularly when the war is over, and not only do the IDPs relocate back home, but many of the refugees will come back home, you will more than likely start to create upward pressure on the need for housing, not necessarily where all the people left from, because wars have a habit of permanently displacing people. Wars are disasters. Um, so, that's something to watch is your, is your um, flows of population. America back in the 1990s and 2000s tried to drive to high levels of home ownership. We had these institutions, you may have heard of them called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, that they put out the whole idea that they were gonna increase the number of people in home ownership through a whole series of I will say after the fact, high risk financial products, they were able to drive the home ownership rate up to 69%, getting close to 70%. And many of you on this call are too young to remember, but trust me, they nearly broke the global financial system. In 2008, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were judged to be bankrupt. They were not technically bankrupt, and it may have simply been a scare, but one way or another, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were nationalized by the U.S. government. Even today, the U.S. government doesn't call it nationalization. They call it conservatorship. But what they did was they wiped out the shareholders, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac became, at this point, directly, pretty directly, government-controlled corporations, and they're still government-controlled 14 years later. So message? Don't drive for 80% for home ownership. Build a rental sector that is professional and high quality. Now that's gonna be a challenge, okay? Because as I, from what I understand, the rental sector, well, first of all, Ukraine has a lot of legacy Soviet housing, which does not lend itself to upgrading and the like. It's energy inefficient. It has single pane windows. You've got boiler systems that were designed to pump steam from Soviet boiler installations. It was what we in America would call dumb housing, but there it is, okay? So you're gonna have to do a lot of rehab. You are going to need to diversify tenure models and you're gonna to need to bring in rental and affordable rental. So there's no question that Ukraine needs a new 21st century housing policy. And at the same time, We've got much more urgent problems to deal with, but everyone should keep in mind that what we do in the present creates the enabling conditions for the future. So you want to bring in rental and affordable rental. It's beyond scope to talk about what the good paradigms would be, but you want labor mobility. You want the ability for young people to form households and get started on independent living. You want lower transportation costs. You want to reduce environmental costs. And you want to harness the billions and billions of euros and dollars that are coming to Ukraine and God willing will continue to come to Ukraine to migrate, not just for the immediate, not just for winning the war, not just for clearing the rubble, but also for building a better urban society. That's the vision. That's what you should be doing. Next, people think the housing in America doesn't need subsidy. 
That's a picture of Oprah Winfrey announcing to people in her audience that somebody in her audience was going to get a car. This is a very famous moment. Okay. So the myth is that housing in America doesn't require a subsidy. Okay. Well, it turns out that's wrong. Virtually every form of housing tenure in America is incentivized. Yes, there's Oprah saying, you get a subsidy. If, I, if you own a house and you take out a mortgage to borrow money to buy the house, the interest on that mortgage is tax deductible. So the federal government helps you. The real estate taxes you pay, they're tax deductible. That helps you a little too. Until 2016, you could do that no matter how big your house was. If you had a second home, you could deduct the interest on that. If you had a boat you could sleep on, you could deduct the interest on that. If you had a recreational vehicle that had a kitchen, a bathroom, and beds, you could deduct the interest on that. Okay? So they are, the, all the homeowners got a subsidy. If you sell your house today and buy a, a, a more expensive house, you don't have to pay capital gains on that. If you sell your house after at the age that's younger than I am, you don't have to pay capital gains on that. That's a subsidy. So you get a subsidy. If you develop a rental property, you get to depreciate the property for tax purposes, even if the actual market value is rising. That's very nice. And if we build affordable rental, and I won't get into the specifics because it would make you all cross-eyed, there's a variety of ways that it can be done. You can use tax credits. There's something called housing choice vouchers. They get a subsidy. So everybody gets a subsidy. So what does this mean for Ukraine? Well, it means that amidst the gazillions of things that Ukraine is going to have to spend money on as this war continues and when this war ends, it's going to need to think about incentivizing home ownership, market rental, affordable rental, temporary residential accommodations for IDPs. Some of this will need to be on the demand side, so helping people borrow money to buy a house. Some of it will need to be on the supply side to develop or to have land incentives. So that's the second myth. Third myth, the U.S. housing system was really well planned. Well, I, I regard the U.S. housing system as roughly equivalent to Laurel and Hardy pushing a piano on a wooden bridge over a chasm with a gorilla behind them. That's kind of our housing system. Our housing system was developed through a series of crisis, crises, responses, and natural selection and evolution. In 1929, America's stock market crashed. It was the last major stock market to crash in the, in the developed world back in the 1920s, <clears throat> but it was the biggest and it kicked off the Great Depression. It also resulted in the first major piece of housing legislation in the US and the creation of what you would, if they were Ukrainian, we would call them the Rooseveltskis, because Franklin Roosevelt put the federal government into the business of building properties that looked like the precursor of Stalinskaya's and Khrushchevskas, okay? <clears throat> In 1946, the GIs came home from Europe, and the housing markets went bananas, and the baby boom went bananas, and so we created a 1949 National Housing Act with special provisions for veterans, which I am sure Ukraine has and will have. In 1967, when I was 14 years old, you could turn on your television and watch America's cities burn because blacks, Negroes, as they were called back then, in the cities were rioting. And that led to a national commission, which led to a tax reform, a 1968 Housing Act and a 1969 Tax Reform Act that pioneered the use of public-private partnerships. Notice, crisis response, crisis response. By the way, each thing that has been created, it, it, it endures forever. Almost none of these programs are gone. They're just layered one over the other over the other. In 1974, we had a recession which led to something called the Community Reinvestment Act. I won't go through that. In 1986, we had a banking crisis which nearly broke the, the Treasury and that led to a lot of banks being nationalized, uh, being slurped up by the FSLIC and a tax credit. 2008, I mentioned that little unpleasantness. And so what does it mean for Ukraine? Well, it means that 
there is a seismic shift in affordable housing in Ukraine that is coming. Invariably, when there is a big political event, a big national event, and war is certainly a national event, that seismic shift triggers a new approach to affordable housing. Each time that happens, the ecosystem becomes more complex, more transparent, more responsive to citizens, and less corrupt. As you probably know, if you read the foreign press about Ukraine, most of which dates from 2015 and 2016, Ukraine is regarded as corrupt. When I say I'm working in Ukraine to random people in America, they have unfortunately the stereotypical answer. You know, isn't that a corrupt place? Why are you working there? I said, the people I'm meeting aren't corrupt. They're, they're the good guys. And I work for the good guys to try to make things better. This will be an opportunity to get not just a more citizen responsive government, but a cleaner and whiter and more transparent government and a better government. Next, next idea. Well, isn't American real estate like the Wild West, right? You can buy, you can sell, you can get foreclosed. You know, it's all about speculation. We read about people buying thousands of homes, you know, these private equity people coming in like barbarians, okay? Well, it turns out that yes, that happens, but they get tamed by a series of regulations. Consumer protection, that's the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, which protects home buyers. That's the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, which protects people from buying property for which there isn't a good title. There are fair housing obligations, meaning you can't discriminate or get caught at it. There's comprehensive environmental quality legislation. We have an environmental protection agency. We protect wetlands, we protect small creatures, we protect fuzzy bears, and we have complicated zoning processes. NIMBY, N-I-M-B-Y, is an acronym that means not in my backyard. And I live in one of the bluest neighborhoods in Cambridge, and my neighbors are all in favor of affordable housing in Somerville or in Medford or in Dorchester, but not in Cambridge. God, no, we don't need it in Cambridge. <clears throat> So the fellow up top is Clint Eastwood. And what Clint Eastwood did to decide how to solve his own housing problems is instead of gutting everybody down like he does in the movies, he became mayor of Carmel, California. And I just sort of think that somewhere, how or other, as you age, you find the ballot box becomes more effective to making this kind of change. But what it does mean for Ukraine is this. Change takes persistence. You cannot put a new housing policy in place overnight. Persistence takes time. Persistence takes persuasion. Affordable housing, my opinion, is a good disinfectant for corruption because the things you need to make an affordable housing system work, rule of law, uh, citizen responsive government, fair procedures, um, elected officials who depend upon getting reelected regularly, those things create a citizen responsive government and a citizen responsive government over time selects out corruption. Next issue. You'd think for years when foreigners would come to America and they'd say, I wanna learn about housing in America, they would go to HUD, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. Because after all, if you're gonna to go to America, shouldn't you go to America's housing ministry? You wanna learn about housing in America. Well, it turns out that I haven't been to HUD. I don't know, Brett, I haven't been to HUD in 15 years, something like that. Two people who used to work for me work at HUD. They're fine fellows. I, they're doing wonderful work. But HUD is not in the lead. And here's why. America has a three-tier system. Ukraine has a four-tier system, right? You've got national government. You've got oblasts. You've got rayons. You've got romadas right? Each level of government has some say in the game, okay? In America, the national government handles demand-side money and mandates. So interest rates, income tax rates, legal mandates. You can't discriminate against people. You can't be a rate, you know, you can't have racial discrimination. You have to reinvest in poor communities. Those are national mandates. 
we create national entities to provide liquidity in the secondary market. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which I talked about, something called the Federal Housing Administration. So there's plenty of money and plenty of financial products. And that's a natural role for natural, national government. States, our states, by the way, if you ever want to tell, explain Ukraine to an American, just say, well, we're about the same size as Texas. And we have a whole series of things. I'm going to show you a picture in a little bit because the geographic similarities between Ukraine and Texas are enough so that it will, it will help Americans orient, okay? States compete with other states for new jobs and they compete with other states for new earners and rich people. Part of the reason Florida is gaining population so fast and New York is losing it it's two parts. One, you can build housing in Florida much more easily than you can build it in New York. And two, if you move to Florida, you don't have a state income tax and you don't have a state inheritance tax. So when you make a lot of money in New York, you move to Florida and buy a house. That's pretty much the flyway, okay? Localities in America handle zoning, and they handle real estate taxes. They also handle police, that's a typo, fire, streets, and public utilities. Brett, who's watching on this, is trying to run for office in his part of Rhode Island. It's very local politics, okay? And you have to deal with local issues and you get a referendum on whether they fix the potholes and whether the power has gone out and whether the garbage is being picked up. Local issues dominate real estate in the United States. Federal government cannot cram land use on localities. So what I think that means is I think it means in Ukraine, the national government and Ministry of Finance have to manage the public finances and Ukraine has to have access to hard currency because you're gonna need materials and labor to rebuild the cities. You're gonna to need to import stuff. Personally, I believe Hromadas and Rayons are where the rehousing of Ukraine will become tangible. Um, and as you're thinking about your new housing system, make sure that you have plotted out what happens at which level of government and what the hand boundaries and handoffs are between those levels. That's very important. Nothing is more fun as a private sector person than watching city government and national government blame each other for a horrible housing failure, okay? All right, last part. Well, America's unique, America's weird. What America does is not portable. So why should we learn about this? I mean, you do it, whatever it is, it's fine, but it, it has no relevance to us. Well, many things are importable if you adapt them to the evolutionary context. Um, the, the cycle in America was there was no government role in housing, then it was directly the government's role, then they went into housing, public-private partnerships, and then in the last 25 years, each has co-evolved the other. There is now a pretty good symbiosis between what you would call good guy developers and owners and what you would call good government types. So that's the evolution. The second thing is, and we've talked about this in our Rehousing Ukraine group. While it's true that Min Region will have many things to say and many tools that can be put out, Kharkiv, Irpin, Chernihiv, um, Aviv, they are very different cities. They're going to have different solutions. They're going to have different challenges. The execution of the rebuilding and the replanning will have to happen at the local level. So for Sedos and others, Think about how you can broaden the capacity of rayons, get more capable people involved at the rayon and Romada level so that they can learn from one another and run many, many different experiments because multiple parallel experiments is by far the fastest thing. There will be need to be some form of inclusive banking. We have not talked about that. It hasn't come up yet. Next one, very big issue. The mo among the most urgent things to do in the damaged cities of Eastern Ukraine is to remove rubble from the streets. 
until you clear the rubble, you can't tell what you've got for infrastructure challenges. And until you get the, the infrastructure regridded, relayed out, you don't know where you're gonna be able to rebuild. So first of all, you've got a clearance issue. We'll set aside the clearance issue. But secondly, you're going to need to redefine where streets go. You're gonna redefine the boundary between public and private space. That's going to be in the national interest. It is a national emergency. In America, the term is eminent domain. In Britain, the term is compulsory purchase. In other countries, it's often called expropriation. It is an essential tool when the city is plastered and the streets are too small and we have to rebuild, there will be private property that will have to be taken by the government for public purpose and public use. That is a police power of government. It is like TNT, it is explosive. It is often used, including in America, for powerful and politically connected people to push aside incumbent low-income people. It is used badly, just like TNT can be used badly. But you're going to need it. And again, for Anastasia and friends at Sedos, studying the, the law in Ukraine with respect to expropriation, compensation, eminent domain, and developing principles to apply it in the redevelopment of Ukraine, that would be a very valuable thing to do, particularly in concert if you could find um, uh, Kiev Mohila Law School or somebody who's got stuff like that. And Krishna, you're right. The, the, the repurposing of rubble or the development of synthetic rebuilding material out of rubble is a very important technological green technology advance. So full marks to you, Krishna, for sticking that in the chat. So that's when you're gonna have to do. The cities that you build will become more vertical. Mixed use and complex zoning will become involved. You're gonna to wanna to learn about something called inclusionary zoning. Again, Anastasia and friends, we can do that offline. Um, but that, that exists in the UK, it exists in Ireland, it exists in Brazil, I'm sure it exists in other places. There are 880 local variations in the US. Um, something similar to that is coming to India, hasn't quite made it there. And so what does it mean? Well, um, now let me just talk about Ukraine and Texas. These are maps at roughly similar scale. Um, Texas, geographically, is about 13% bigger than Ukraine. Okay. Texas east to west is just about the same size as Ukraine east to west. Texas south to north is just about the same size as I've been counting the Crimea in Ukraine, Ukraine south to north. The population is reasonably similar and the variation of geography is dramatic. Okay? I mean there is dramatic variation between the rocky stuff the Great Plains or the steppes as you might call them, the lowlands, and then you've got cities. And I know you have not been to America, but trust me, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, Houston, might as well be on four different planets. They are four completely different cities and they're all very large. So what it means is that you've got to create options. You've got to create a menu of things that different localities or oblasts or rayons can pick and choose. Things like climate, availability of building materials, of the, 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 the amount of built environment that is available, the amount of, of that can be repurposed, uh, where you can attract industry, uh, including IT and other kinds of uh, uh, green and sustainable industries, market dynamics, all of those things are going to influence the ultimate new strategy for Ukraine. Um, I, I would flag further, I'm working with the presumption that when the war is over, Ukraine will control the Dnipro all the way to the Black Sea, and we'll have a security border on both sides of the, the Dnieper. That's important because you have to have flow in the Dnieper so that you can manage the export of grain materials and you're gonna to have to have security. Those are all things to think about because they will affect where people settle and what your growth industries are gonna be. And I'm sure people at Keefe School of Economics are thinking about all this stuff way better than I am. 
To make this happen, you want to bring the private sector in. The private sector is an incredibly powerful beast once it's domesticated. Human beings figured out how to domesticate dogs. They figured out how to domesticate horses. They figured out how to domesticate cattle, okay? You can use those beasts of burden to pull your sled where you want to go. That's what you use the private sector for. You can do that. There's a huge opportunity to do that. Um, yes, you dangle money in front of them and they behave the way you want. There's a lot that's involved in doing all of that. So I've actually done pretty well. I've covered that in my course of 45 minutes. I should say further, my, my little commercial here, um, my little commercial is that, that as Anastasia knows, Four and a half months ago, when Russia invaded Ukraine, five and a half months ago, God help me, when Russia invaded Ukraine, I had two weeks of being terrified. I thought Ukraine would lose. When I saw that it wouldn't, when I saw that the Russians were as bad and militarily as I thought they were, and that the Ukrainians, unbeknownst to everyone, fought hard, I said, Ukraine is going to win. And when Ukraine wins, it's going to have to start rehousing and rebuilding. And so I committed our little nonprofit to helping Ukraine. That's how I met Anastasia. That's how I met a whole bunch of other people. That's how we started an initiative called uh, Rehousing Ukraine um, that has been that put on a series of conferences, virtual conferences. You can find them online. Um, Anastasia and Sedas will post them or reference them in the Facebook page. We've also had ongoing dialogue with Min Region, and we're currently trying to develop pro bono for Min Region or for anyone else solutions on how to how, how to create a rental compensation scheme for IDPs, how to turn old uh, spa hotels into IDP housing in Western Ukraine. So I've been spending absurd amounts of time trying to be helpful on the challenge of rehousing Ukraine. And I plan to keep on doing it because I regard it as the most important thing, most largest challenge I've seen in housing in my professional career. And the one that is most urgent, the, the one that's the most urgent I've ever faced. So that's why I'm doing it. Those are my principles. And if you don't like them, well, I have others. I do respond to emails. There they are. I respond to questions. We've got some more time. What do we got, Anastasia? I see some comments in, in, in chat, but I also see that uh, Julie, hi, nice to see you here. Yeah, and uh, if you have any comments or questions, you can just say them. I've got lots of <laughs> thanks and comments, and um, I'd like to also thank uh, David very much for all his incredible efforts in organizing his seminars, which are most uh, most interesting and show a lot of passion and creativity and commitment. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank David for that long-term effort over the last few weeks, um, few months, um, but also um, thank uh, Anastasia and Sados uh, for hosting these seminars um, uh, and also the research that sits behind them, the an analytical work and the the comments, uh, the contributions to ideas. Um, it would be um, amiss now not to focus on some of the very interesting ideas that David has also uh, raised. Um, and there's a, there's a few that, that came to mind. Um, one, one was um, uh, he mentioned um, sort of the caution around the dominance of a singular ten tenure and the importance of having choice um, and that that choice be a genuine one um, and a professional one. Um, the other one that, um, that you stressed, which I think is very important, is about the levels of government that are responsible, but also have the resources. So there may well be some uh, forms of le legislation sitting across the nation, but the responsibilities might sit lower but the resources um, are not, uh, commensurate resources are not there. Perhaps also the capacities are not there in terms of what um, capabilities um, in planning and um, in housing promotion and, and also the, 
the new ideas around neighbourhood planning and inclusion of, of what makes a neighbourhood a good place to live. Maybe um, there needs perhaps to be a matching of the capacities at that level um, in terms of professional and planning capacities, but also the financial um, and funding resources, perhaps also revenue streams. So trying to get those uh, fiscal and those um, uh, human resource capacities together. It'd be really let interesting. Me to hear Julie, let me stop you there for just a second and then you can go to your next one. Uh, I 100% agree. Um, um, you have to, the funny thing is, just like parents with children, national government never thinks lower government is ready. Yeah. And, and, and what you have to do is you have to delegate, you have to, you have to provide transparency, you have to give them freedom to, to screw up and then come back and ask for help. And then you have to learn quickly. So yes, you must delegate, you must capacitate both with knowledge and with resources. And you have to understand if you're trying to learn in a hurry, how does a kid learn? By falling down and scraping his knee. How do municipalities learn? By doing something dumb and then doing it better the next time. So we are not gonna be in a zero defects business. Continue. Yeah, I was thinking also, how can we, to some degree, yes, you know, we learn by making mistakes and we learn from them, but it's a big country um, and there's a lot at stake. And there are also uneven contexts. Some are heavily damaged and some are have overstressed rental markets. So there are different issues. So how do we ensure um, a coherent, uh, you know, how do we promote equality of outcomes? One of the, um, uh, the dangers, of course, of uh, picking a city, as we've been encouraged and, and you know, twinning and so on, is, is the unevenness that might be created by some being forgotten or ignored. But one, one thing um, to bring in is on the land resettlement or on the land readjustment and the kinds of uh, tools that you're um, suggesting will be important. Um, in the history of some of the European cities, it seems that, like in Finland, that land act, that key land act that was made at the sometime after the war, that's when things picked up, that there was this authority and clarity around the land and the ability of municipalities to um, do strategic redrawing of those boundaries and negotiate the allocation of the rights and privileges, if you like. So perhaps um, we could learn from that too, the 1949 uh, Land Act in Finland, which was, if you like, the bedrock of what municipalities could later do. Um, well, let me, good, allow me to add something to that, build on that a bit. Mm. Yes, it's instructive that even though World War II ended in 45, it took four years for the US to get a National Housing Act. It took four years to get a Finland, for Finland to get a Land Rationalization Act. Mm. The second thing that you're gonna have to do though, I think you're gonna have to develop possibly even faster is a means of making rapid adjudications in situations where the title is unclear or the owner cannot be found. The one I, I like to cite, Julie, is in Colombia, when the FARC, those nasty terrorists who turned into, into drug dealers, were trying to, to uh, uh, upend the government, they had a habit of blowing up county records to destroy mm -hmm. all the records to make it possible, impossible for people to establish what land was. So Colombia developed essentially a, a, uh, a land, a, a title correction mechanism. Mm. The mechanism was this. <clears throat> if you came in with an affidavit that said, I've lived here for six years, and each of your abutters came in and, and attested to the affidavit, yes, Juan has lived here for six years, and this is Juan's parcel of land, right? So if you and your abutters collectively said, yep, that's Juan's land, then the government would give you a title and clear the title even in the absence of the interruption of the title. I suspect, asterisk, that in the case of Ukraine, you will find there are a substantial number of assets, large real estate assets, the ownership of which may be opaque and which might hypothetically be 
traceable back to someone with ties to the bad guys. When government has land that it cannot locate the owner on, there is a condemnation or seizure process of taking in REM. And it seems to me, Julie, that there will come a point where Ukraine will need to have a law that says, if you do not come forward and claim that you own this land and document that you have proof right to it, then we will take it under our in rem proceeding because the national interest demands we do it. Now, that, all I'm doing there, Julie, is I'm aggregating the land. <clears throat> I, haven't, I haven't necessarily given it back to the Rayon or the Romata to develop, but you can't work in situations where land is owned by people who you cannot find and get accountable. They did this with, with slums in London in the 1880s when it turned out the Duke of Grosvenor owned a bunch of stuff. And there's lots of white lands in Saudi Arabia that nobody knows about. So your point about, yes, having clear boundaries and a land entitlement or land act would be very powerful. You're going to need something before then too. Yeah. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about um, the municipal land leasing because many of those um, Khrushchev um, buildings are um, privatised, but they sit on um, municipal lands still. So, you know, we've got this sort of quite complicated situation that need not be made complicated. Um, and there are ways in which um, joint ownership or, or these kind yeah. of arrangements could be. I mean, well, one, for, one, for the benefit of the Sados folks, just to, and for the audience, <clears throat> allow me, Julie, to back up and, and tell the, the, the folks. Imagine if you own the building, but the land on which the building sits is leased to you under an agreement of some duration. Okay. That's called in Anglo law a leasehold interest. <clears throat> the lease instrument controls in effect the building, except to the extent that it's delegated in the lease. If the lease runs out, you lose possession of the building. You lose ownership of the building unless you can literally pick it up and take it away, which you normally can't. So in addition, if there is an obligation like a debt, like real estate taxes or an environmental cleanup cost, <clears throat> that can be the, the obligation to deal with that can be embedded in the land lease. So ground leases, Julie, are used in a number of contexts, of which the UK is the best example. Because the UK runs on big pardon? Rotterdam. Rotterdam too. Amsterdam. So, yes. <laughs> okay. So the idea here, Anastasia and friends, is you could make a taking of the whole area, a, 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 a collaborative taking of the whole area to replat it put it on a big long-term land lease, subdivide parcels on subleases, and then enable development in a variety of ways. And then the land lease agreement, but you can call it a community land trust, you can call it a homeowners association, you put it in a ground lease, you could put affordability restrictions in there, zoning restrictions in there, shared maintenance. There's a whole variety of ways that you could manage the growth and density of the city. And so, yes, Julie, it's, it's a very good idea in cities that will be will want to rationalize that and where they anticipate there will be continuing job growth and continuing property value growth for sure i mean a really good neighbor um for ukraine on this model is finland again the city of helsinki of course leases around 70 percent of its land for housing and has some influence on the segments of the housing market that it serves um, one, one of the, you know, dominant tenures, as you've mentioned, is home ownership. Um, and, but people have very low incomes and unable to maintain the houses that they own or that they're in their position. One of, one of the measures that they use um, in Helsinki is the right to occupancy housing. And that, that might be interesting also as an affordable housing model that sort of satisfies people's interest in um, stability um, and a sense of long-term right to living. So it's a lifetime, lifeline, lifelong uh, tenure, but the right to occupancy 
requires them only to have 15% stake. Um, the land itself is not, um, it's, it's owned by the city and, it's, and the development is, is leased, uh, leases so that what, land. But what it's, you're developing there, yeah. what you're talking about there, and Julie, I'm conscious of time, so I'm gonna give it back to Anastasia, because what, what you're talking about there is a tier of people mm -hmm. who don't have a housing problem. They have an extreme poverty problem. Housing is the thing that starts to enable them to deal with the extreme poverty problem. You can have that kind of housing. You just have to recognize that the cost of that housing is almost completely going to be non-recoverable. Therefore, it's going to be government funded, which is fine. So, so whether you call it permanent supportive housing or, or transitional housing, or there's a variety of terms for it, and it, it shows up. It can absolutely be included in the larger ecosystem of housing. It is just the point I'm making is only it's very expensive to deliver, and it's it, it will you will never deliver it purely out of the private sector because you'll never solve it with financing. Mm -hmm. Anastasia, where are we on time and uh, comments from other folks and so on? Uh, yeah, so we still have a couple of minutes. Maybe somebody else has or questions or comments. If not. I also have a question for you, David. Let's first go to the floor for the, for the participants first. Well, Anastasia, why don't you go if you've got a long list? Okay, I, I only have two questions. I have one more of like a short-term question because I know that in a short-term perspective, the Ukrainian government now is working on this rent compensation program for IDPs. And uh, of course, it's uh, similar programs have been deployed in different countries and maybe you David have thought about some risks and opportunities of this program what are the main advantages disadvantages of similar programs um well, I'm going to start with something simple winter is coming and while for Americans that's a tagline from Game of Thrones uh Countries that have cold winters can't deal with the homelessness problem the same way that countries that have warm winters can. People have to be housed. There's no way that, that all of the IDPs or the refugees will be able to return home in time. Therefore, temporary accommodations are going to be needed over the course of the winter. Going back to my issue about about jobs and location of jobs. The second thing that IDPs are going to need is income of some kind or another. Because again, Anastasia, we've not talked about it, but the war has, has taken away lots and lots, millions of jobs in Ukraine. So you want to think about where can we find structures which could be adapted for six months of high density living is this an old hotel? Is it a school? Is it a sole? Is it a, 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 a currently empty facility because the, the, the industry is not working there? Is it a school by day and a dormitory by night? When you start, when you think about the things that you have to do to get through the winter, you can reach the conclusion that you will adapt things in a temporary way because you have to. Um, further, even in disrupted markets, people value what they pay for. So you'd like to have a system where the households have some choice, but the amount that they are asked to pay is manageable to them and the landlord, whether the landlord is a converted school or the landlord is a private homeowner or a landlord is a family member, gets something closer to the market rent. So you, what you're talking about would be called in the UK housing benefit. I'm sure there are other terms in other countries, but the idea is it's a rent paying subsidy that covers the gap between the minimal amount that the household can pay or the small amount the household can pay and the amount of cost of occupancy has. Ukraine has that now as for utilities. You have a law that, that, uh, that says people should pay 15% of their income for utilities and they can claim reimbursement for it. So I, I clearly 
temporary accommodations is an urgent priority and some kind of guidance has to come out of, from Min Region. Uh, Krishna has put in the idea of metal buildings as temporary housing. There's been discussion about micro units. The problem with micro units is I don't know how you can import enough of them fast enough for them to be useful. Again, Ukraine's a big country. Try importing thousands and thousands of micro units into Texas. So what's your second question, Anastasia? Yeah, the second question is circling back to the United States. Uh, you mentioned that there is approximately 5% of affordable housing in the United States. Yep. Um, my question is how this system is operated and financed, both on the national level and the local level. Because as we see in Ukraine, the uh, affordable housing stocks are pretty scarce. And sometimes local governments, they do not have enough capacities or enough experience of managing those systems. And also we do not have enough financial support for those systems from the national government. Yeah. So my yeah. question is, how is it managed in, in the US, for example? Okay, we have, we have four or five different flavors of it. The oldest form of affordable housing is what's called public housing, which is owned by municipalities. It has no debt on it. It was built between 1938 and about 1965. It's sometimes they're family style, they're three and four story walk-ups. They look like brick Khrushchevskas. Sometimes they're high rises for elderly. I was trying to see if I had pictures readily at hand. Ordinarily I'd be able to pop them up, but I haven't got them at hand. Those are run by municipal governments. And I'm sorry to report the municipal governments are not very good at it. So that starting in the late 1990s, there was a nationwide movement to privatize those and to rehab them. Most of them migrated into being owned by nonprofits. We have a fair number of large housing nonprofits. These are similar to HLM uh, in, in France. Uh, they're similar to housing associations in the UK. They're, they're privately owned but owned by a nonprofit organization, often Anastasia faith-based. So National Church Residences, Mercy Housing, which is Catholic. Um, there's a strong connection between a community of faith, a congregation, and group housing that dates back hundreds of years. Then for the last 35 years, we've used a form of investment called a low-income housing tax credit which brings, of all people, banks into investing in the housing through a developer and the developers of the kind I was describing, a private developer, sometimes in partnership with the municipality, sometimes in partnership with a nonprofit, and the banks invest solely for tax benefits and for negligible economic return. So those are, those are in terms of the, that 5%, it's that range. I should mention also, very important, that when we produce new affordable housing, it's hideously expensive. We pay a lot per unit. So the units look really, really nice, but they cost a lot. So we can't produce as many of them as we want. Oh, that's, an, that's another thing, by the way. Another myth about the US system is we've solved the problem. Uh, answer, no, <laughs> we keep trying. <laughs> okay, thank you, David. I think we are running out of time, but if anyone else has question or a comment, that is a high time to you to speak up. I think this has been oh. very interesting and thank you very much. Uh, Anastasia, Nevada Hand, a local nonprofit in Las Vegas, has been doing a lot of low cost housing in conjunction with you know, getting the land from the city and building the housing. And I think right now they're building about a thousand apartments They've just completed the subdivision with about uh, 200 homes. So they're really aggressive. And I'll, I'll get in touch with them and get you some information. Oh, that would be excellent. And uh, Julie, thank you for coming and thank you for contributing so much. And, and to Anastasia and to the folks at Sados, I'm, I'm, I'm honored by the invitation. I'll get you the slides. Uh, anybody who wants to do please follow up. Uh, I think about this stuff. Uh, I, I, I have three I have three states of existence. I am awakened by myself. I am um, making sure my wife is happy and I'm thinking about Ukraine. That's all I'm doing these days. So uh, I think I've got my priorities more or less straight. Anyway, Ukraine on my mind. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you, everyone. But they David, thank you for the wonderful talk. It's been very informative and interesting for me. And uh, I encourage everyone, if they have any other questions, to reach David by email. As he said, he's answering emails regularly. But also, please uh, do follow activities of Affordable Housing Institute. Uh, their website is present on the description of our event. And uh, also follow our activities here in Sados. And yeah, we will post slides. We will also prepare a Ukrainian summary, Ukrainian translation uh, of this wonderful talk so it will be more accessible for everyone in Ukraine. And yeah, thank you once again. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.